Jul 228. Daarna zal ik mijn geest op alle mensen uitstort. Jullie ziens en jullie dochters zal profiteren. Jullie oude mensen zal dromen droom. Jullie jong mensen zal visioenen zien. Marcus 16, 16 en 17 zei: Elkeen wat gloeien en gedoop wordt, zal verloos worden. Maar elkeen wat niet gloeien, die zal veroordeeld worden. Hier is die wonertekens wat die zal beleven, wat gloeien. Hij zal duivels in mijn naam uitdrijven. Hij zal een nieuwe taal vragen. So kom aan kerk, Matthies 28 vers 19 sê, Gaan dan, maak al die nasies my disciples, en doop hulle in die naam van die Vader en van die Seen en van die Heilige Gees. glad that each and every one of you is here. Thank you for coming and thank you for the online watchers also being here tonight, sort of here. <laughs> I hope all of you are well. Please just go to someone that you really don't know and just ask them, how was their day and do you, are you fine for the week? I know like there's a school holiday, so the children are fine, but is everyone else okay? You are more than welcome to sit down after you greeted someone. <laughs> okay, I also want to know, are there any new people here tonight? I see a lot of new faces here tonight. If you are new here tonight, please put up your hand. You're going to get a nice packet of Doritos. I'm also new here tonight, so I also need a packet of Doritos. If you don't know what Dorito means, it means little piece of gold, because you are like gold to us. And then, is there anyone that had their birthday the past week? Yay, boy, like, I mean, very, I mean, um, <laughs> happy birthday. Thank you, Nanti. It was just gone. <laughs> I'm so glad that you had your birthday. Very, very happy birthday, and I hope it was a blessed day. VBS birthday is actually tomorrow as well, and it was Martin's birthday. So happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, so I'm going to do the CFN. So if you would like to be informed about our services, activities, and ministries, you can visit the following platforms, the LWC app or our website. Please note that our evening services will be taking a break for the holidays. No evening services will be on the 2nd of April and the 9th of April, but we will resume on the 16th of April. Then we have our sunrise service, Friday, 7th of April at 6 o'clock in the morning at Living, the, uh, Living Word Centurion at the field. Please bring your own camping chair. There will be a fun run after the service. And please bring your own picnic basket or order and pay your 
own Boerenwurst roll combo online at 50 Rand per person. You can either um, order on the website or on the app. And then we have our Easter service on Sunday, 9th of April, 9 o'clock at the Living Word Centurion Auditorium. Then our courses for Terms 2 will kick off um, on the 18th of April. Please note that all of our co courses are currently presented in Afrikaans. 9 o'clock Tuesday morning, Skeping Stew will be with Dot van der Merwe. And then 7 o'clock Tuesday evenings, we will have our marriage work mentorship, the liberating truth, and then we have our new course in the beginning. For more info and to enroll, please visit our website www.lwc.org.za or our LWC app. Thank you, and then it's time for Via Beer. Oh my goodness, please start praying now. So I only use English is self-defense, I promise. So this is actually very, very exciting for me to do this in English tonight because I received word a couple of years ago that I have to sharpen up my English. So first time I heard that, I was like, bro, are you joking? This is like rare ek Engels praat. Yeah, because even when I'm in class and I teach the children and I speak English a little bit, they ask me, sir, are you from the farm? And I was like, uh, yeah, why? <laughs> it's like, you sound like a burki. And I was like, thank you very much. So I take it, but I'm going to try my level best tonight. So since I've got that word up until tonight, there was a few times that I, I thought about it and reflected and thought, okay, I got word to sharpen up my English because God wants to use me internationally as well. And sometimes I reflect on that and I think, okay, but... Not a lot happened since then. And now tonight, they have the same opportunity to reflect again and say, okay, but what changed in the past few months that I thought about it previously? And then the question came, okay, but what did I do in the meantime? So nothing came to pass because I didn't really do anything about it. And we can pull that wire through with our finances as well. I want to stick to one scripture and this, this, this part of scripture was when the, um, when the, when the owner went away for, for, for a couple of weeks or months and he gave um, his servants um, silver bags, uh, bags of silver. And then he came back and you guys know the story that the one that had five gave five more and the one that had three gave three more. And the one that had one said, no, I was afraid because I know you can be cross. And I, I put away the one because I was afraid of what you might say if I lose it. And in, and in this piece just stuck with me. Matthew 5, oh, Matthew 25, verse 21 said, The master was full of praise and said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And I think this is not just regarding our finances. I think this is in our everyday life. God gives us certain talents, certain opportunities to do something. And that is how far he goes for a while. Then he expects you to do something back, and then he can take you further. So I don't know what is your situation tonight. Maybe you are sitting here and you think, yo, dude, you have no idea. I don't even have five rand left in my bank account. I'm not here for your money. I'm here for your commercial mate. Obedience, obedience, stewardship is a nice word. What do we do with what we have? So I want to encourage you tonight, whatever you have to give, it may not be finances, but let us give what we have unto the Lord, and He is the one who can multiply whatever we put into the basket. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we have the opportunity tonight to be together as family. Lord, thank you that you are a good God. Despite us, Despite what we do right or what we do wrong, you stay good all the time. You are a good God. And Lord, we thank you that we can just give what we have tonight into your loving hands and know that, God, you are a God of multiplication. You don't add up, Lord, you multiply. And we say thank you for that opportunity tonight just to give what we have 
And God, may everyone that gives tonight or everyone who wants to give be blessed a hundred and a thousand times in your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to sow into the kingdom, there's Snap, Scan, and there's uh, Internet Banking as well as the the Arkans. Deacons, am I right? Yes. Deacons is also coming around. Thanks, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Weber, it's Weber's birthday tomorrow, and although he already had a Kit Kat for his birthday, <laughs> um, let's just pray for him as well. Lord, thank you for Weber's life. Thank you for his commitment and his love for you. Lord, I'm so blessed whenever he worships. Uh, I can see somebody that worships you with spirit and in truth. And that he, Lord, is fully dedicated to you. Thank you for that. Lord, we pray that this year will be a year that you will use him mightily, that you will raise him up, and that it will be a, a new time, a new season for his ministry. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So it's my privilege to introduce Johan and Christelle. Christelle, Johan, will you not up? So the two of them, ach, you can't even come stand. It's so good to see you. Yeah, net die voor. So the two of them, uh, Johan, if I think of you, I think of a man after God's own heart. That's scripture about David. That's how I see you. And, and the two of you, uh, me and Dot, we love you very much both of you, uh, because we see the growth that the Lord has, is doing, busy doing in your ministry, and he's, he's uh, developing you and using you mightily, not only for the youth and the young adults that you're uh, responsible for, uh, the ministry training, the things that's developing there, and I'm hugely excited about what the Lord's going to do in this coming year for the two of you. So can we stretch out our hands and just pray for them? Lord, we, we want to come and bless Johan as our speaker tonight and ask, Lord, that you will lay your words in his mouth. And even if he speaks to us, um, uh, share your word with us, Lord, that he will be blessed by what you are also revealing to him while he's speaking. Lord, I pray for both of them. I pray for their ministry. I pray for, their, for them as family. I pray, that, Lord, that a year in which you will do new things for them, that they will enjoy what you are going to reveal, going to teach them. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So there's a, there's a baby on, on, on its way, and I said to Johan, before his next birthday, Christelle, he's going to have the privilege to discover something new of the Father heart of God. Because when you have your first baby in your arms, there's a revelation that nobody can explain to you in words that you experience when you've got your first baby in your arms. So that's a blessing awaiting you for this year coming. So great. Thank you. Ryan. Thank you, Walter. You're welcome to join us in standing and let's praise the Lord, name of the Lord tonight.
remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. But he heard every word, every whisper. And now those altars in the wilderness. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Him. This is our God, this is who He is, He loves us, this is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. Jesus, we praise you, we honor you. Thank you that we are forgiven, that we are set free by your blood. Faith be the sun that calms the storm inside. 
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For big and I survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our
Father, we praise you, Son, we praise you, Holy Spirit. Because you're holy. You're most holy. Tonight, we just want to lift your name on high. We want to honor you. We want to praise you. We want to lift our hands in worship to you. Because you're holy forever. Who can compare with you? generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Sing it. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever. song forever to last. Ooh, we'll sing this song forever and amen. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all Positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, O creation.
Just as you're standing there tonight, I want you to bring your burdens before the Lord tonight. You're in His presence, everything that's burdening you, everything that's on your shoulders, bring it before God tonight. The Father says, give your burdens to me tonight. And then open your soul and surrender to Him tonight. You are in His presence. Lord, we just thank you for welcoming us in your presence, in your home, Father. And Lord, now we open our hearts and we praise you with everything in us. All our spirit, Lord, and we give you our burdens and our sorrows and the weights we carry, Father. We give it to you, Lord. You will carry it for us. You will give us rest. Just where you're standing there, just worship him with everything in you. In, your, in what you say, in, in your heart, just give it to Him and worship Him. Just take this moment in His presence, in His love, in His gentle love for you. Just love Him back. Respond to His presence. Father, now we just praise You. We love You. We worship You. We give ourselves to you in joy, Father, and we thank you that you carry our burdens for us. Everything, you carry it for us. You give us rest. You lead us to the water where there is life. You restore life to our souls. You are beautiful, God, and we thank you that you welcome us into your presence. We heal when we come into your presence. We restore when you come into our pres in, into your presence, Father. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You are welcome to take your seat. Thank you, worship team, for tonight. Great. It is my joy to be with you guys tonight. You look great tonight. Amen. Great. So my name is Johan, 
And uh, I'm a youth pastor. I work with VBA here. Great to work with you. Just starting off. Great. <laughs> and uh, my wife is here, Christelle. And yes, you've heard um, we're expecting a baby in September, end of September. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, as I um, was thinking about this baby that's coming and everything, you know, a few interesting things happen when. Uh, I'm sure you that already had children, you know, people have a lot to say. <laughs> so um, what happened is we went for the blood test to see, you know, if this is, if she's now pregnant and everything. And as we came into the, uh, as I came into the room with a blood test with a, with a lady that wants to draw the blood for the blood test, she looks at Cristal and she says, oh, is it your first one? And she says, yes. And she looks at me and says, is this the dad? I'm like, hello, yes. <laughs> And then she says, enjoy the ride. And I'm like, whoa, okay. And that made me think, you know, what is the world thinking about fathers? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> like, hey, I'm here. I'm even with the blood test, I'm here, okay. So tonight, um, what I wanna talk about tonight is the topic that I wanna, or the sermon title that I have is the, God's Kitchen, okay. Not Hell's Kitchen, that show, no. God's Kitchen. <laughs> okay, the reason for the kitchen is because, you know, for me, a kitchen is a, you know, it's a place where you get fed, you know, you make food there, and sometimes it's a place where people sit and eat together. Uh, there was a time when we were in Cape Town, and there were, uh, we stayed at a place where there's a table in the kitchen, and uh, we, s we sat with my brother then. We just have a good time around the table, in the kitchen, all right? Also, on the, if you look at movies, sometimes when a character is really stressed, they go in midnight, they sit at the kitchen table drinking a glass of milk and thinking, you know, of their concerns and, and those type of struggles, you know? So, as I had this, you know, God's kitchen idea in mind, let me, let me show you the verse where I got this idea from. Listen to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And I just want to read up to there. I read that verse and I thought about being a child of God. And I thought about, hey, but how would it, what would it be like to go and visit God at His house, you know? Just imagine he had a house, you know, down the road, you know, he, you're in Club View, he has a nice house, you know, what would his house look like? And I got this image of a kitchen table where God sits at the kitchen table having a conversation with Jesus. And I thought, that's very interesting. Isn't that a nice image? So would you like to go and visit God when he had a, if he had a house here in the neighborhood? Yes? You know, what would it be like if you go there, would he open the door, hey, welcome, do you think he thought about you before you came? Do you think there's a room for you in the house? Do you think he's, he knows you when you come visit? Do you think you can ever pitch up unexpected at God's house? Well, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. So, I just started imagining going to visit to have a coffee with God at his house, you know, down the road. And I want you, I want to take you tonight on that journey, all right? Are you ready to go and visit God for a coffee, all right? Yeah, so I want you to imagine this event. I'm going to quickly have you imagine it, and then I'm going to give you details, because I thought about how would God respond, you know, what would be the things in the house? Would there be a certain culture in the house, or would, um, who would you meet first, you know? Or how would you feel? You know, ask, all, ask the, all these questions, okay? So let's imagine it, and then I'll take you on a road that the Bible tells us, that, you know, shows us how God would have responded and acted in that situation. Are you ready for that? Can I have an amen somewhere? I like interaction, yes. Okay, cool. So I want to imagine, I want you to imagine going to God's house and, you know, um, on the way there, you think, he probably thought about me. And you know, before people come and um, visit you, you know, 
let's say you and your wife voted and dot, you know, sitting at the house and Johan and Christelle comes to visit. But before we come, you talk to each other about the visitors, you know. Yo, how do you feel about them, you know? You know, are they, do you like them, you know? What do you thought about what he said there, you know? Have you ever had that conversation before someone came to visit? Yes, I think, I think it's normal for us to do that. I think God did that as well. He might do that as well before you come to the house. So on the, on the way there, I would think, well, God is probably talking to Jesus, you know, the Father and the Son talking about us, uh, the Holy Spirit there thinking, hmm, what, what would they want to eat, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so on your way there, you think that. And then you get to the door, and Jesus opens the door. And he steps out, and it's almost like he steps into your way. And he says, you can't enter yet. We have to talk first, okay? And then you're like, whoa, okay? You have a conversation. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you have a conversation, and now you're ready to enter. He opens the door. You go through the hallway, and you enter the kitchen. And there's God sitting at the table welcomes you and sits down with you, and now it's your time with God to have a conversation. Have you ever thought about maybe what would you say to him? I have. God, why that? Come on. Like, I asked you for that. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> I'm joking. But, you know, you sit at the table and you have this conversation with God. And then you want to get up and God says, okay, good, that was great, nice coffee, um, then you want to enter out the door you came, and he says, no, 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 you can't enter, you can't exit that way, you have to exit the other way. In my house, says the Father, you can never exit the same way you came in. Weird. That, but that's what I thought. I'm going to tell you why that is now. But then you say, okay, and you enter or exit the other side, and you go out, all right? Did you see that in your mind? Did you see the kitchen table? Okay. It's brown, it's wood, okay? It has a little plant on it. It has a pink, uh, not pink, okay. Anyway, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the time that the father and the son had a conversation about you, okay? That conversation did not happen during the daytime. It happened at night, one midnight, late at midnight. The father couldn't sleep, sitting at the table, looking concerned, okay? Jesus sees that the light's on, there's a, you know, one single light shining onto the table. Jesus sees this light, and he comes into the kitchen, and he sits down next to the Father, and he knows the Father very well. And he says to the Father, Father, what is bothering you? What is, what is your concern that you cannot sleep this time at night? And the Father says, I'm thinking, I'm concerned, my heart is sore because of that one, and that one, and that one. And the son experiences this heartache for the father. And he says to the father, what can we do? And the father says, I have a plan. And the son says, send me. I will make it happen. I want you to be happy, father. And the son goes after the father shared this plan with him. So I want to... I want you to think what that was, what God shared with Jesus Christ. And this is what he did. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, there's a whole list of blessings and things that Paul gives in uh, Ephesians 1. And one thing I noticed there is that most of the stuff in that chapter is things that the Father did. Not the Son, not the Spirit, but the Father did. The Father had a, had a, had a plan. The Father had a desire. I want to read it to you. I'm going to tell it to you, you know, like it is in this whole um, situation. You can go look it up in, in Ephesians 1. We're not going to put it on the, on the um, screen now. I'm just going to tell you what it is. In Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 3, the Father wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing. The Father chose us before the foundation of the world. The Father wanted us, this is all the Father, the Father wanted us to be holy and blameless. The Father, in His great love, planned for us to become His children. This is all happening in the Father's mind when He sits at the table in that kitchen, thinking, 
I want to bless them with everything. I want to, I have chosen them already. I want them, okay? I want them to be holy like I am. I want them to be my children. I want to have a room for them in my house. I want them here. You know, God is a father, and that is why he created, because he wanted to follow, okay? So he was sitting there, destined us to become his children. The father wanted us, and that was his intention and will to get us. The father wants to give us grace through his son. This is all in in Ephesians chapter one. The father wants Jesus to tell us about him. The father wants Jesus to tell us about him. That is cool, I think. (laughs) The father wants, um, or the father is the one that made a plan for us to to become his children. It was his plan, originally his plan. The father um, prepared for us an inheritance as well. You know, when you're a father, you, um, you, want, you have a lot of porsche laws for your kinders. You want to leave an uh, inheritance for your children. The father wanted this as well for us. That was what he was thinking. I want, I want an inheritance for them, okay? The father wants us to know him. He wants us to know what future he has for us. He wants, to, he wants us to know what that inheritance is that he has for us. And he really wants us to know how powerful he really is. So while the father was sitting at the kitchen table there and Jesus coming, he was, you know, sharing, I want them, I love them, I have a plan for them. This is the plan, my son. And Jesus says, send me, I will fulfill the plan. I will do it. I'm your son. I know you. I know your heart. I know you love them. Okay? That's the conversation they had. And uh, that's when he went out to make sure that you know the way to get to the house of the Father. Does that make sense? How cool is that? So that's the stuff that's in the Father's heart when, when you are on your way to the Father's house, waiting for you, thinking, oh, I want him. I want her. I have a plan. How exciting that they are coming to visit. So as you, as you arrive at the house, you get out of um, your car or off your horse or I don't know how you travel. Um, you arrive at the house and Jesus steps out and he says, whoa, whoa, okay, okay. The first thing Jesus tells you is, are you sure? <laughs> okay. You're standing outside of the threshold. You know, this is the... This is the threshold of the door. If you step over it, you're no longer outside. You are now inside, okay? But you are outside still. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you sure? How would you respond? Yes, of course. (laughs) No, I don't know. What do you mean? (laughs) Yeah, so are you sure? So let me give you an illustration why Jesus asks, why, you know, are you sure? Um, If you think of having a toothache. Who's, who's had a toothache before? Well, there's some that haven't. I want to know your secret. But anyway, some of you had a toothache, okay? And then if you're a small child and you have a to- toothache, you don't want to go to the dentist. Like, I don't want to go there. But I want the pain to go away. So you go to your mom and you ask your mom, mom, give me, I, I have a toothache. And the, you know your mom's going to give you a aspirin or something to take away the pain. But you also know that the next day you are going to the dentist, if you like it or not. She, you, she was, she's not just going to take away the pain now. She's going to sort out what is happening. God is the same way. If you come to him with a pain now, unfortunately, he's not only going to leave it there. He's going to see the job through. He's going he, he's to fix more in your life that you are comfortable with. So Jesus comes to you and he says, are you sure? Because... He's going to fix more in your life than you are comfortable with. Got to go to the dentist. I don't want to go to the dentist. You're going to go to the dentist. If you step over this threshold, you're going to the dentist. (laughs) All right. I want to read you what C.S. Lewis says about this. So uh, C.S. Lewis wrote the book or the novel Narnia. 
And he was a literature professor, and he was an atheist as well at some point. So he wrote about what Jesus might have said in terms of counting the cost before you step over into that house. Okay, so listen, this is what he said. That is why he warned people to count the cost before becoming Christians. Make no mistake, Jesus says, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself, ooh, that's not good. <laughs> I need that. Whoa, sure. Okay. I'm all chill. I took my black for Got it. I got it back. Good. Um, I think this one goes there. Let's put it like this. So, listen to what he says. Make no mistake, if you let me in, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for. Nothing less, no other than that. If you, if you have free will, you, if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand that I am going to see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you on, in this earthly life, whatever or inconceivable purification it may cost you after death, whatever it costs me, I will never rest nor let you rest until you are literally perfect. Until my Father can say of you without reservation that he is well pleased with you as, as he has said that he is well pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will do nothing less. So Jesus standing at the door, he's saying, no, that if you step over here, I will work in you. I will make you perfect. Just like when I step into that kitchen with my father, he looks at me and he says, you are perfect. I am well pleased with you. I will work in you that when you step into the father's presence, that he will look at you and also say without reservation, I am well pleased with you. So Jesus, that's the first thing Jesus say, says to you. Are you sure? Count the cost, all right? The next thing I think Jesus will tell you is, know this, you are forgiven. This is very important to know. I want to put that first verse on. It says in um, Romans 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You need to know that you are forgiven. So when he says you are forgiven, he stretches out a name tag. And he puts it on you and he says, forgiven. Okay, if you notice, you have one on you, all right? So that's not there accidentally. But he stretches out and he puts a name tag on you and he says, forgiven. The father needs to look at you and see the tag, forgiven. Okay, so you're, you're almost there, Jesus tells you. Count the cost, are you sure? Okay, yes. No, the second thing, you are forgiven. You have to know that. Here's the name tag, okay? The third thing, or before you go to the third thing, the reason you need to have that tag to say you're forgiven is because the Father is holy. He will not, he's allergic to sin, okay? He cannot allow any sin into your presence. So when Jesus has worked in you and he has labeled you as forgiven, when the Father sees that, he knows the Son has worked here. Okay, so, yeah, the third thing that he does is he says, okay, when you enter the kitchen, when you enter the presence of God, you have to do it with confidence. You can't just, hello, are you there? No, you have to walk into that place, okay? You have to march into it. Don't be, with confidence, step into the presence of God because he loves you. All right, he loves you, he welcomes you, he's excited, he's been waiting for your, your entrance into this kitchen. So when you enter, march in there like it's your place. <laughs> okay, that's how you enter, no, no other way, only with confidence. I want to put you verses, verses up for you that just um, illustrates that. In, in Hebrews 4, verse 16, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. If you go to Hebrews 10, verse 19, it also says, Therefore, brothers, since we have, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, 
by the new and living way that He opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. And since we have a great priest in the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, with full assurance or full confidence, with our hearts sprinkled clean of an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with water. In other words, you march in there with all your confidence that you possibly can gather, okay? Because you are forgiven. That's your name. That's who you are. Don't, don't doubt. The Father is waiting inside, but I know my dad. I know my Father, says Jesus. You step in there with all your confidence. Amen? So the first thing you would say is, hey, are you sure? Second thing is, know something, this, you are forgiven. Thirdly, when you go, all your confidence, you march in there in the, in the presence of the Father. Amen? So now the third part of the story, you step into the kitchen and you, okay? you come around the corner and you see the Father at the table and the Father smiles and He gets up and He sees you. And guess what happens the first moment God sees you? He forgets. Okay, I'm all chill. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he forgets. Your sin, of course. <laughs> he forgets you, your sin. So, Hebrews 10, 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So he looks at you and he forgets your sins. So there, then there's no sin left, okay? So the first thing, when you enter this, you may feel a little bit ashamed or exposed because the Father knows everything about you. He knows when you go. He knows when you come back in. He knows all your sins and all your embarrassing moments. He knows everything. So the first thing, you, when you step into His presence, you may feel a bit ashamed. But He forgets your sin and he's, He welcomes you into it. The the other thing that happens when you step in after, you know, God forgets your sin and everything, you change. Something in you completely changes because you step into the presence of love and life itself. Not someone that has life or has love, someone that is love and is life. It's very different. We have life. God is life. Okay? Okay? You step into the presence of love and life itself. Something in you changes. Okay? And I imagine myself stepping in there, experiencing this love and life, but feeling exposed because God knows everything. So there's nothing you can hide from Him. I sit down and say, Lord, you know everything. Ooh, you know, you know what I did. And He forgets that. And He says, hey, welcome. Welcome here. Isn't that cool? The next thing the father does when you enter into that kitchen is he says, come sit down. Okay? Now let me prove that in the, in the Bible. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of this great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up and seated us with him. In heaven, or in this context, at the kitchen table. Not only anywhere, but on Jesus' seat. So that's where Jesus normally sits. You come in, and Father says, sit here at Jesus, on Jesus' chair. I want to have fellowship with you. So he lets you sit down. Listen to what Psalm 23 says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my health, of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the house of the Lord, there is a table prepared for you. When you sit down at the table in, in Jesus' seat, there is your favorite meal ready for you there in the presence of the Father. Isn't that beautiful? So the next thing the Father does is He lets you sit next to Him. Okay? Then he reaches under the table and he pushes a present towards you. 
That's what the Father does. Pushes a present towards you. A present, wow, how nice is that? Who likes presents? Yay, Jesus pushes, or oh, God pushes a present towards you, and as you open this present, it changes your life. Okay, listen to Romans 5, verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness shall reign in life um, through the one man, Jesus Christ, gives you a gift of righteousness, free, happy to see you. This is what I have for you, righteousness, awesome. <laughs> and then as you sit down and you open this gift, your entire being changes, okay, literally. Not you, it's not an experience, okay. It's more than experience, your essence change. You move from death to life in that moment. You were dead, but you move to life. If you're in the presence of life itself, you come alive. So as you open this present, you be, your spirit comes alive. How cool is that? I hope the next page is the right one, yes. <laughs> Listen to what it says in Romans 5, or not Romans, uh, John 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So as you open that present, presence on that kitchen table, your being regenerates, okay, it's it's like your spirit comes alive. You change. You are no longer dead spiritually, but you are alive spiritually. Another thing happens. You move from being a slave to being a son or a slave to being a brother. I want to um, read to you out of Philemon chapter 1, or there's only one chapter, uh, verse 15. <laughs> Now, this story was about a, a guy that sinned and that, that was chased away or that, that ran away out of the house. He, you know, he probably destroyed something or did something very wrong. And then Paul wrote a letter to the church leader called Philemon, asking him to receive Philemon back because he's, or not Philemon, Onesimus is the slave's name. This slave has literally become, you know, a slave, not a slave, a brother, because he's been saved. He got saved in prison. So this is what Paul says. He says this. For this is perhaps Onesimus was parted from you for a while that you may have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you in the flesh and in the Lord. So when you come into the presence of God, you move from death to life. You move from slavery to sonship, from a slave to a son. Your status changes. Your value changes. That's what happens just by sitting at the kitchen table in the presence of God. You, are, you, you can never be the same after you've moved from death to life You're, and, and from, from slavery to sonship. You're a different person now. And, you know, that's why you cannot leave the same way you came in because you're not the same person. Okay, but we'll get there. Then as you start having conversation with God, with the Father, He tells you the next thing. He tells you, now, son or daughter, you need to give me your burdens now. That's the next thing He tells you when you are at the kitchen table. Give me your burdens. I can see you are weary. I can see you've been trampled by the world. You are at my house now, in my presence now. Give me your burdens. That's what I do as a father says God the Father. Give me your burdens. Listen to uh, Psalm 55. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. He wants to sustain you. Give me your, your burdens and your struggles. Give it to me, says the Father. The last thing He would say, I think, now, you know, is or he wouldn't say it, it would happen, you would start to rest in the presence of God. You would start resting. You would feel 
refreshed. You would feel like you have new life. You know, you, you're rested. Listen to what Hebrews 4 verse 1 says. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fa fall by the same sort of disobedience. Entering the rest of God, giving your burdens to Him. All the burdens, burdens of deeds, burdens of, you know, the world. Give everything to me. And when He takes it, you start resting in His presence. And that's when the real fellowship starts around the kitchen table. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? That's where I want to go. So, I'm just going to run through it uh, quickly again. You know, you come into His presence first thing he does is he forgets. <laughs> and then he welcomes you to sit on Jesus' chair. He pushes a present to you, righteousness. The moment you open that, you receive it from him. You move from death to life, from slavery to sonship. And he starts telling you, hey, son, daughter, give me your burdens. Give me the, your struggles. When you give it to him effectively, you start resting in that kitchen with the Father. And then what happens next is interesting. Are you ready to hear it? Yes? Great. So then he says to you, son, daughter, you need to go. You cannot stay here. You need to go. And you say, no, I want to stay here. I just want to worship you and just want to have fellowship. No, no, you have to go. It's time to go. And uh, you, when you leave, you cannot enter the same way you came in. You have to go out that door, okay, because you are different. Now, when you exit that place, that house, when you meet someone else, you are physically, you appear different. You are changed completely, all right? And, and I want to illustrate this to you. Again, C.S. Lewis, I just recently read the book again. So, he was an atheist, and he looked at Christians, and he started realizing, but they look different. They are, there's something about them that's not like us, okay? And I want to read his words to you. Are you, re are you ready to hear it? Listen, it's so awesome. He says, um, already the new kind of persons are dotted here and there all over the earth, he says. It's a different kind of person, this, okay? Some, I have admitted, are still hardly recognizable, but others, you can, you can recognize them, Okay? Every now and then, you meet them, okay? How interesting is it? He's an atheist describing it in this way. So every now and then, you meet them. Their voices and faces are different from ours. Stronger, quieter, happier, and more radiant. That's how he describes their faces. They are, I say, recognizable, but you have to know what to look for. They will not be like the idea of religious people that comes from the general reading. What, what he's saying is that it's not like they've read a book and now they do something that makes them look different. No, it's not like that. They don't draw attention to themselves like that. It's not, it's not that. You tend to think that you are being kind to them, but actually they are being kind to you, he says. They love you more than all the brothers and all the men do, but they need you less. Let me say that again. Think about that. They love you more than all the men do, but they need you less. That's how he describes the Christians. They will usually seem to have a lot of time, and one wonders where it all comes from. <laughs> how interesting is that? <laughs> when you've recognized one of them, you will recognize the next one much more easier. I, and I strongly suspect, but how should I know, that they recognize one, one another immediately and infallibly across every barrier of color, class, age, and even creeds. In that way, to become holy is rather like joining a secret society. To put it at the very lowest, it must be great fun. <laughs> That's what he says. 
so they're different. He describes them. You know what I, what I can relate to, what I can see is their faces are different. Stronger, happier, more radiant faces. And, um, you know, they love you, but they need you less. How interesting is that? That's how this, you know, when you leave the father's house at the other, you know, out the other door, you are different. And this is how you appear. You are stronger. Your face is stronger. Your voice is different. Your face is more radiant. You seem to be at peace. You seem to have a lot of time, and, and people wonder where it comes from because there's a peace that is around you. That's how you change when you come into the presence of God. That's how you leave, okay? So um, the reason you should leave is because God desires you or desires that all people come to his house. He desires that everyone out there should know him. And you are the one that needs to go and tell them. Listen to what it says in, in uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. This is good and, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. God desires all people to be saved. That is why God says, son, daughter, you cannot stay. You are changed now. You have to leave. You, you, the change that you've gone through is something of me that is in you now. And I want that to go out, to bring those children that I desire, those children. Remember the first, you remember the first conversation Jesus and the Father had? That he destined them to be his children, that he wants them, desires them, has an inheritance for them, a plan for them. He desires them to come to him and visit his house. You need to go and invite them. Amen? Yeah, so um, the world must know the truth, and you need to leave out that other door because you're different. God has a desire because now you are also his son. And as the son sat at the table hearing the father's heart, you are now also his son hearing his heart for the, lo for the lost and for the children, the orphan, the slave out there. Amen? Now, um, the worship team can come up if they, if they are ready. So I want to throw in a plot twist as the worship team comes up. I was very specifically describing a place. And that place is this place, the church. <laughs> this is the Father's house. You have come today to the Father's house. Before you came here, you thought about the church. <laughs> you thought about the people, the, you thought about God. That is why you came, because of God, you know. Before you came in, I don't think you did maybe think this, but it's a good thing to think about, is that you are forgiven. Maybe you did something during this week that made you feel guilty or that made you feel ashamed, sin or something. But when you come to the church, you may feel exposed. You may feel a little bit ashamed here, and you have to make things right with God. But when, before you step in, you need to ask the question, or you need to hear Jesus asking you, are you sure? Make that choice. You're at the dentist, okay? Second thing is, no, you are forgiven. Here's your name tag. Did you see all your name tags? You received it outside, right? It actually happened to you. Do you see that? You actually, you actually received a name tag, just like the one I was describing when Jesus puts it on you. You are here tonight at the table with a forgiven tag on you. Before you came here, you need to know you're forgiven. There's no condemnation for you, okay? Second thing is, you know, um, you're sure, right? Did you walk in here with confidence? Or was it begun seeker? Should we do an icebreaker? I'm a youth pastor. You know, we have to think about icebreakers. <laughs> but did you, did you come in here with confidence? Because this is the house of the Father. There's a room for you here. You should come to church while you sit in the car before you come into this place. You need to ask yourself or tell yourself, am I sure? Yes, I am. Am I forgiven? Yes, I am. Here's my name tag. 
now I'll get out of this car and walk up to those awkward people giving me name tags and I will walk into this place and I will lift up my hands and praise the Lord because this is the Father's house. The moment you step into this place, out of the door, the Father sees you. What does He do? Forgets your sin. And He says, come, sit next to the table. Here, where you are sitting, guys, do you realize that you are sitting on a chair with a forgiven sticker on it? Do you see that? You're sitting at the table now with the Father. <laughs> and uh, the Father forgets your sin. He, he allows you to sit here. And while you sit here, if you allow Him, you change. Your very essence changes when you are here. Then He gives you that present and changes your very identity. He changes you from dead to life, from being a slave to this world to being His son. If you have that name tag on, and if you sit here today, allow Him to change you like that. Okay? <laughs> and then what happens as you sit here, I want you to start just giving you, your burdens to Him. You're at the table. Give your burdens to Him. Then you will rest. Okay? You, you guys, I can look at your faces. I know you need rest. You desperately need rest. God has it here for you. Before you thought about it, you walked into his kitchen today. Do you think you sitting here was, is a surprise to him? You just answered me earlier. You can never pitch up at God's house unexpected. So he, he knew you will be here tonight. He knew that you will sit here at the table. He knew that you will have a forgiven sticker on. He wants to bless you. He wants to give grace to you. He wants you to know the inheritance that he has for you. His heart is burning to be with you. He doesn't have time for sin. He dealt with that. His son dealt with that. And it filled his heart with joy when his son destroyed sin on your life. And now he's sitting here and, and saying, stop thinking about your guilt. Stop thinking about your shame. I know everything, yes, but I want to, when you are here, no need to feel ashamed because I have grace for you. I have an inheritance for you. I want you to know me. I want you to know my heart. Not only that, I want you to know how I feel about the children out there that is not here. Amen? My heart is sore for them. That's what Jesus says. That's what the Father is saying. He's a good father. He created them because he's a father. Okay? You know, when, when we became pregnant, it's so cool story. It's, uh, we shared, I shared with some of my friends here, but um, I'm not going to share the whole story. But when we finally got pregnant, it was like God said, finally, I can be a father to another child. He, there's not enough, you know, there's more, more rooms than children in his house for more children he's a father he wants to sit with you at the table and you are here today at his table and then what will happen is um, when we are done here tonight you're leaving out maybe you need to leave out a different door tonight amen you remember which one you came in i came in from that one i'm gonna leave out that one <laughs> leave out a different door because you are a changed person you sat at the table tonight you sat at the table tonight. Maybe you are here and you're thinking like a slave or thinking like an orphan. Maybe you are here and accidentally you sat at the table with God tonight. Maybe you need to turn to the Father tonight and say, Father, I've never called you dad before. I've never called you father before. But I want to be your child. I want, I want you to love me like you love your children. I want to live here in your house. I want to go tell the lost orphans out there how good you are and how loving you are and how gracious you are and how deep your love is for us. How, how your love cannot be measured and your grace cannot be measured. Maybe you need to, I know there's a ministry team praying for people here. Maybe you need to come to the front and ask someone to pray with you just to facilitate that conversation you need to have with God. Amen. And like I said, don't sit here and say, no, it's not me. 
God is not surprised that you are here. He's been waiting for you at midnight, thinking about you. Amen? So I want to go back to that verse, 1 John chapter 3, um, verse 1. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. And as, as I read that, I'm just thinking about that lady that says, enjoy the ride. <laughs> she does not know a good father, possibly. I don't know what's her story. Okay? <laughs> um, but God is a good father. Okay? He's not like your earthly father. He's not like an earthly father. He's much more better, more loving. Like Voter said to us, Nana, um, I'm waiting for that revelation. I want to see the love of the Father for a child. How beautiful is that? But that love the Father has for you. So the world does not know you because it does not know the good Father. Amen? So, beloved, we are God's children now. So I want the worship team, that third song, um, Praise the Father, praise the Son. I think it's time now, as we go into that song, to respond to God. Okay, so can I ask you to stand up with me tonight? As I said, beloved, beloved children of God, His presence is here, and now is your opportunity at the kitchen table, here at the front of the church, to respond to the Father and say, Father, praise you praise the son praise the father praise the spirit that is here amen are you ready for that are you ready to respond to the father amen lead us in that let's go praise the my privilege to close the service just to bless you now usually I say stretch out your hands and receive the blessing of the Lord but can I do it a bit differently today by the way guys you are his youth group what a privilege uh, to have a theologian like this um, sitting under him and mentoring you I think you you re- really really privileged uh, and thank you for explaining good theology in a nice way that's a good teacher thank you you so take your hands put it on your forgiven sign just go underneath that to underline it and let's receive the blessing of the lord lord i i will i want to bless each one of the people here today lord your children thank you that that's their identity in christ children of God and Lord if I bless them I want to bless them 
with the knowledge, the intimate knowledge of know knowing that they are forgiven, that they are cleansed, that they've got the free gift of righteousness. Lord, thank you for your love. And Lord, we want to bask in your love. We want to enjoy that. And therefore, I want to come and bless each one of them with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May it be over their lives. May, may they be confident and lift up their heads in the fact that they are forgiven. So with your hands on your chest, I want you to, to push out your chest. Be proud. Druk thy bors uit. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, thank you that we can go now by the power of the Holy Spirit, with the, with the knowledge that we are forgiven, that we are righteous, that we've got the good news of Jesus Christ on our lips, that we can go out and be those people that C.S. Lewis wrote about, that's different, that shines. Lord, may we invite people to God's kitchen, to a place where they belong, May they want to come because they see the Holy Spirit, the love of God in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. So the ministry team is going to be in front here ministering to you. If you need prayer, please come to the front. The rest of you, you'll have coffee. If you came in by that door, you need to leave by that one. It's part of, your, part of a mental exercise that you need to do. So um, if you came in through that door, it's only a few of you, you may leave at that door. Thank you. Bless you guys. Donkey, you want.